All right. Um, can you hear me all right? It's working fine. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, I've done it a couple of times before. I keep switching things around. I keep changing the title of the talk because I really don't like the title. Um, even this one, I mean, it, it's technically correct. It has strings and processing and optimization in it, and it's, it's accurate in that way, but really, it's the story about... Um, I, actually, so th one version, I called it performant string processing, and the thing is, English is not my first language, and I didn't really know what performant meant until... Oh, I, I thought it meant fast, you know, uh, and I looked it up, and it means fast enough. And that's not really accurate for this talk because I, it, it, I went from I went a little bit too far. You know, I, I got it to the point where it was good enough, and I just kept going. It turned into this obsession where I just kept working on the script. I kept changing things. I tried to rewrite core functions to make them faster, and you know, it turned into a real obsession. Um, but I think you know, obsession, uh, uh, optimization is you know, it's. It's a lot of fun. It's it's sort of a guilty pleasure, and you can just really overdo it and just uh, work on something for a while. So our conference is a perfect opportunity for that, I think. Um, yeah, my name is Jana. I'm a co-organizer of the Elixir Malmo meetup. If you're ever in Malmo, please come say hi. Um, you also have my Twitter and my GitHub there. Uh, the thing is. My self-worth is strongly tied to my number of Twitter followers, so <laughs> help me out. I work for a company called Castle. We do user security as a service, um, account takeover protection, credential stuffing, uh, automated security workflows, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, about this talk, it is going to be, there's going to be a lot of code. Uh, but every code sample is sort of self-contained. It's small enough that you can follow along, that you can keep it in your head. It doesn't really need to be very heavy. Um, and even though it's talking about uh, string processing, specifically it's a lot about strings, it ties into optimization in general in the Beam and things to like be aware of in the Beam. So I'd like to start with this quote because it is you know, my guiding light when it comes to optimization. Um, you know, focus on building something really nice before you start worrying about optimizing it. And the, um, I'll get into the, the story of this, but th this is sort of a legitimate use case, even though I went overboard with it. Um, the, the focus of this talk is a challenge. Uh, it started as a post on the Elixir forum. Uh, a bunch of people helped out. Uh, Jose had some answers. Um, and there was something about this this piece of code that was not performing as expected that really caught my attention and yeah, I just kept working on it and improving it and at some point I realized I spent so much time with this, I have to have something to show for it, so I wrote an article about it and that eventually turned into this talk. So, this is the task, this is the challenge. Uh, it's from a German blog post, Google Translate did an okay job uh, here, I think. Um, the task is basically a script that reads from standard in, splits that uh, input into words, then counts the frequency of each word, sorts it by the, by the count, and uh, pretty prints it. And it has this added stipulation that it should be, you know, 10, code, uh, ten lines of code, it should be neat. Um, so, n you know, it's not code golf, and it um, it also came with a sample input of about 1.8 million lines of text, uh, just ASCII separated by spaces and new lines. So it's a pretty simple input, but still has some size. And it also came with implementations in different languages. Uh, and I tried to run some of them to get an idea of you know, how, this should, how this should work. And I think the C version is interesting because it gives you sort of a baseline of this is as fast as it gets. It, it might not be the perfectly optimized version, but for all intents and purposes, this is as fast as it gets. Um, it's not exactly 10 lines of code, but you know, it's, it's C. Uh, there's a Python version. Uh, reasonable size, pretty simple code. It finishes, finishes in eight seconds. And to me, eight seconds <coughs> is amazing. For an interpreted language, eight seconds is really, really good. It's just twice as slow as the uh, C, which, I mean, that's amazing. 
really, I mean, I would expect something within, you know, reasonable is within an order of magnitude of C. So eight seconds is really good. And there was a Ruby version. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you shouldn't be laughing. 17 seconds is fine. <laughs> wait, wait till you see the Elixir version. Um, and for some reason, it uses three gigabytes of memory, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> we have memory. OK, so uh, I wrote what I thought was a reasonable Elixir version. It uses a nice pipeline. We like pipelines. Um, it, star it starts by creating a stream of standard in. It then flat maps over it to turn that uh, stream of lines into a stream of words, then reduce over it with a map to count each word, and sort it. it this turns it into a list automatically. Um, and sort it by the count, and then finally just pretty print it. And it takes 120 seconds. This this what that I felt was a perfectly re perfectly reasonable piece of code is seriously underperforming. It is not you know what I'd expect. So why is it so slow? And I'm gonna use this opportunity to do audience participation. Uh, raise your hand. I'm gonna I'm gonna count off the different steps as I see them, and I want to hear or I want to see hands where you think that this is what's slow. Um, so let's start with reading. Nobody. Okay. Splitting, a little bit, OK. Counting the frequencies, a couple of people, yeah. And uh, we got sorting everything, got some hands. And then finally printing it. I don't think all the hands really added up, <laughs> <laughs> but all right. So um, here's a breakdown of what actually took time. So technically. If you add the numbers up, you're going to see that it doesn't make sense. This is about 90 seconds, not 120 seconds. So the thing is, I wanted to measure each part separately, but I was using streams. And streams interleave the function calls. Um, I tried using the profiler, but if you run this script with, uh, with like fprof, it just, it just makes your computer really, really warm. <laughs> <laughs> I let it run for like 30 minutes, and I gave up. Um, so what I did instead was I added a step where I just turned the stream into a list, and that made it a lot faster, just getting rid of the stream. Um, <laughs> yes. So um, I'm going to take a moment to, whenever you talk about Elixir scripts, someone always brings up, you know, well, Elixir has a VM. It takes time to start up. And, you know, other languages have VMs too, but you are right. It is a little bit slower. Python, for some reason, r is ridiculously fast. That doesn't look like a real number. Um, but still, I mean, I think Elixir, it, on my machine, if you run it a couple of times, it goes down to like 500 milliseconds startup. I mean, that's, I think that's reasonable. Um, Ruby here is 400 milliseconds, and it's seen as a reasonable scripting language, so I think it's fine. And then just quickly, I want to talk about runtime performance and developer performance because, I mean, we're here because we know that there's other things than just having the optimal uh, code that runs as fast as possible. We want to be able to write, do more things with fewer lines of code. So Elixir, the fast parts. Let's start with counting. I'm not doing them in order because the order you apply the optimizations, you know, it changes how noticeable they are. So first of all, let's talk about ETS. ETS is a little bit like having Redis in your virtual machine. Um, it is mutable, where in an in a environment where there's no uh, mutable data structures. It is super fast. Uh, it is not garbage collected. And it's a really uh, good, uh, this is a really good use case for it. It changes the code a little bit. You get this glaring hole in the pipeline which is unfortunate, um, but the code is mostly the same. You have to create the table. You then use update counter, which is specifically designed to increment numbers. And then you have to get your data back out of ETS. 
and this makes it three times faster. Just getting rid of the map makes a huge difference. And we're actually kind of to the point where, okay, maybe it's starting to get reasonable. Um, but we can do more. Oh, but I want to say that, you know, we shouldn't really complain about maps. Maps are great. Maps are super fast. They're a great uh, data structure. They're immutable. Immutable data structures are great in a concurrent environment. Um, it's not that maps are bad. It's that if you, in some use cases, if you put a lot of data into them and you write into them a lot, these are just like 500,000 keys and you're writing to it millions of times, it does slow down. So the other direction is splitting. Split is a very nice function. It's very easy to use. You just give it a string and it splits on all the possible white spaces. But if we think about it, if it's splitting on all white spaces, it must be looking for all white spaces. What if we reduce the search space? What if we tell it we're actually just interested in spaces and new lines? It should get faster, right? So in most languages, you return to regular expressions for this. And you can do that. Uh, split takes a second parameter. You can give it a regular expression. And the thing is, different platforms, different implementation, have different regular expression uh, engine implementations. Some of them are really fast. Some are surprisingly slow, like Go. Uh, JavaScript is super fast. Elixir is super slow, or Erlang's, I guess. So this actually slowed it down. We're looking for fewer white space characters, but it's slower. But don't worry, there is an option. Um, split also takes op uh, a pattern. So patterns can just be strings or lists of strings that you want to, in this case, split on. And that does make it faster, considerably faster. So we proved our hypothesis. Um, just reducing the number of white spaces to look for made it faster. And this is what it looks like now. It hasn't really changed that much, I think. And then comes reading. This was the first part. This was a smaller one. Um, but it kind of ties into splitting, as you'll see. First of all, there's a Unicode. So again, Elixir, and this is a recurring theme here, Elixir has really good defaults. Sometimes those defaults, um, in some use cases, can be problematic, but it's the, re it's the reasonable default to have. And Elixir, almost everywhere, uses Unicode. For some reason, regexes don't use Unicode. It's, um, but everywhere else, I think, it has Unicode support. Except we're just looking at ASCII, and we don't really care about that. And Unicode has an overhead associated with it. So Elixir does expose an alternative version. Uh, so we add three characters here, drop Unicode support, and we make it a bit faster again with just three characters. We're down to 21 seconds. Now I'm going to do something a little bit more extreme. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about memory efficiency. So Streams, the original version uses streams. And streams are nice because they can um, allocate, so in this case, we allocate strings uh, on demand. And each string, after it's used, can be garbage collected, which lets us keep a nice uh, low memory profile. But streams have an overhead to them. Jose calls it the stream tax. It slows everything down. That's what we noticed when you, know, you just add enum to list and it makes everything faster by just getting rid of the stream. And then the other thing is that calling split 1.8 million times on small strings is slower than calling split once on a 1.8 million times larger string. So this is how we fix that problem. We replace the bin stream of lines into reading large chunks of the standard input and just turning it into a string immediately. As you might expect, this will uh, increase memory usage a little bit, um, but it also makes it faster. Um, you might know about, um, there's also uh, io.read all, but that one is slower than this because it uses a much smaller chunk size. So it makes it faster. Again, we're down to 15 seconds. We beat Ruby. So, yay. But we're using five gigabytes of memory. We have memory, it's fine, we don't care. <laughs> so this is what it looks like now. 
we've uh, gotten rid of a lot of the problematic areas. We've gotten to a point where it's, it's reasonable. We're in that range of dynamic languages where we should be. It's not necessarily like the beam isn't optimized for this use case. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it, we shouldn't be able to do these things. Um, so I'm doing all right with time, so I have, I have some bonus slides. Uh, first of all, we've got IO lists. This has been one of the things that I think people get more ex most excited about, and it's a really cool thing. Um, so basically, a lot of virtual machines have this built-in optimization where, so okay, uh, first of all, if you have three strings and you want to concatenate them all together, you first have to concatenate string A and string B, and that gives you uh, an, a, an extra string, and then you take that string and concatenate that with uh, string C and you get your assault, but that extra string is just immediately garbage collected. So it's just waste. And if you're doing a lot of concatenations, you're throwing away a lot of strings. So, for example, V8 JavaScript engine will automatically, um, if you concatenate strings, it doesn't actually concatenate them for you. It just says, okay, fine, I'll do it. And then it makes a list. And it keeps putting things in that list until you try to sneak a peek, until you try to look at the string, and that's when it actually turns into a string. Um, I think the JVM also does that nowadays. Uh, Java also has, you can do string builders to create, to have this behavior where you add things to this builder, and it will efficiently build your string eventually. Elixir and Erlang also has it. The Beam also has this optimization. Uh, it is uh, used, for example, by Phoenix and JSON. If you're doing JSON outputs, you can actually you can do register before send, and you can take a look at the response body before it's sent. It's not a string. It is this huge list of lists of lists of strings, and some of them are just tiny pieces. Um, and yeah, so a bunch of the I.O. functions in Erlang and Elixir uh, accept I.O. lists or I.O. data as an alternative input instead of a string. And that uh, in this case, I'm using I.binWrite, but you can also use I.puts. You can try that out. Just pass a list of strings to I.puts, and it will just concatenate it for you. Um, so the change is pretty small. Return enum.each into enum.map. Just build a list of the strings that we're interested in. There's no concatenation. And then we pass this list of lists of strings to i.binWrite, and it does everything for us. And it's faster again. And then the thing is, so when I was doing this, I, at some point I realized that it must be spending a lot of time doing garbage collection. And um, I figured, this is a script, right? Who cares about garbage collection? We can just keep eating up memory. Um, eventually, you know, the script is done, it's, everything's released, it's fine. Um, so I tried to figure out a way of turning off the garbage collector in, in the beam. Um, turns out it's not possible. Uh, it, it's tightly connected to how heaps are allocated, and we need to allocate heaps to be able to do this. Um, and heaps, process heaps start as a very sm in a very small size, and they keep, you know, it'll grow. Um, as it needs more memory. And that got me thinking, what if you set the initial heap size to a very large number? I'm not actually sure what the maximum number is. If I, if I change the 5 to 6, it just errors out. Um, but yeah, just a big number. And that does make it faster. <laughs> so this is about as fast as I got it um, without turning into concurrency. There's a concurrent version by Evadne Wu. Uh, she made it run in seven seconds, which is, s that's amazing. I mean, it's really getting close to C. It's, it's impressive. And, you know, Elixir is a good language for writing concurrent code, so it makes a lot of sense. But I don't have time to get into it now. You can find it uh, on my Twitter account. So, uh, takeaways. We've gone through ETS. We've gone through Unicode, um, reading I.O., Splitting, splitting with patterns, uh, IO lists, IO data, and hacking the garbage collector. But the core thing is basically El Elixir has sensible defaults. It has really good defaults. And when they're not enough, there are options. 
It's one of the best things about Elixir and this ecosystem. You can always turn to something else when it's not working. If a map isn't working, you can use X. If X isn't working, you can use counters or um, atomics. You can use, you can go, go uh, low level and use NIFs or you can use ports. There's so much stuff you can do. You're never stuck. So this was the, the story of my obsession with the script, basically. Thank you very much. Thank you. So anybody who was, wants to ask something about strings? I, I should say also, if you have any ideas with how to improve this, I've tried, I've tried everything, but if you have any ideas, please come talk to me. I would love to hear it. Did, did you, I have a question. Did you try like the, the OTP, in the newer versions have like these persistent term and all, like a few of those new ways of storing data? Did you try any of those? I tried everything. No, so, um, <laughs> So at ElixirConf, Miriam Pena had a great talk about the fa like these fast tools in uh, in Erlang, and she brought up counters and you know the process dictionary. And I'd never thought about it. you know I could use the process dictionary for this, and I tried it. Um, I just put all the strings in the process dictionary. The problem is, in order to do increments, uh, you'd have to first read it, get the number, add it, add it by one, and then put it back. And that's sort of an expensive op operation, which isn't really optimized by the process dictionary. And then secondly, you also have to filter out all the stuff that you know, actually needs to be in the process dictionary uh, when you get your output. So it's not faster. <laughs> cool. Oh, there's one over there. Uh, yeah. So right now, there's a meme of beating uh, WC with different languages uh, around the internet. And I was looking at the C implementation, and they create a uh, bitmap of uh, non-white space characters and white space characters, and then they shift that by one, and then you can find find the word boundary boundaries. Mm -hmm. So that could be a good way of uh, improving on the split. We should talk about this after. Sure. <laughs> Great suggestion. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.